Hi there. Thanks for joining. I'm delighted to speak about this topic at VIEW. It's such an interesting time for content creators. There's no doubt we're faced with massive challenges in developing, producing and delivering animated content to audiences on a myriad of platforms. As big as those challenges are, there's an equally sizable opportunity to leverage VR and real-time tech to transform our content business. The media format you deliver your content in doesn't need to be a spatial format for your business to benefit from XR spatial design workflows. In this talk, I'll show you how I use it in my creative process and also how I witnessed a sea change in the studios I collaborated with using this revolutionary approach. To give you some context, I'm a multidisciplined visual storyteller and creative media executive. I've been in the media and entertainment space for around 20 odd years, from advertising to film production, TV development, and VR. In my previous role as VP creative for immersive entertainment at NBC Universal, I led creative innovation, strategy, narrative design, and visual development across traditional and emerging media with a focus on animation, XR, real time, and virtual production. In parallel, I'm an independent animator, illustrator, and character designer. So these two sides, independent content creator and entertainment executive will often converge in varying amounts, uh, the common thread being visual storytelling, of course. Now, as a creative consultant, I originate IP and develop entertainment franchises, particularly for animation. I blend my executive experience with my passion for the craft to transform the origination, production, and distribution of CG content to be more democratized, creator-friendly, collaborative, and efficient. And by leveraging XR and real-time creative tools, I'm able to ideate stories and visualize worlds in ways I simply couldn't do before. Here's the challenge we all face. Simply put, CG production pipelines are siloed by their output formats. Despite having common steps and similar asset requirements, the processes have evolved with different specifications and they just don't play that nicely together. And that's been fine for a while, but today we are faced with an ever fragmented audience. That audience demands content that's tailored to whatever platform they're on at any given time. And as content creators, if we want to originate strong IP and build franchises with real reach and longevity, our approach to animation production has to be much more nimble than it is today. So we can unlock a level of world building that really makes the most of these unique formats and cohesively, right? To serve story and character. The emergence of spatial design tools brings methodologies to create in a smarter way, an alternative to the established two-dimensional interface of a monitor, keyboard, mouse, and tablet. Visualizing an XR can significantly speed up iteration and dramatically reduce the learning curve of design and visualization for all skill levels. One of the things I love doing in VR is developing concept art that's quite versatile because it's spatial, you know, let's call it spatial art. Art that I can inhabit whilst creating it, which really helps me focus on directorial choices, especially the emotional beat of the scene. I can observe what I'm creating from a character's point of view and from a director's overview. I find VR sculpting a way more intuitive way to move 2D character designs into 3D. Check out my workshop at the conference where I walk through how I use Masterpiece Studio to design toys, create illustrations, rig and animate characters, and model assets for AR prototypes. But now back to this talk. Historically, I found working in CG to be creatively unintuitive and artistically unfulfilling. I'm driven by storytelling. I'm a fan of the craft. What keeps me engaged throughout is this process of visual ideation. And that can be really slow with traditional CG tools. You know, spatial design software like Masterpiece Studio, Gravity Sketch, and most of all, Tavori, connect me with my ideas in 3D like none of the traditional CG apps have ever been able to. Those apps involve too many barriers for my way of working. But Tavori gets out of your way so you can indulge in the story ideation process spatially and visually. Here's a virtual set I built within Tavori. This is the secret lair of the antagonist in the story, a mad scientist turned power-hungry galactic overlord. I used a mix of primitive 3D models included in Tavori's library, and models shared publicly on Google Poly. You can even browse Google Poly from within Tavori, which is really handy. So that's all I need to sketch out a set like this for previs and prep the environment for layout. 
The menu system feels like a shelf full of toys, enticing you to just sort of pick up and play with the items. Working with the camera is as point and shoot as it gets, literally. Before I get properly into layout for the actual scene, I like to explore compositions and angles that might serve as reference for concept art, or look dev. Even at this primitive stage, I've worked out a lot of the scale and general design ideas I want from the overall set piece. It's the equivalent of bold strokes in a painting, if you will. And as I do this, the visuals I'm framing will spark story beats in my mind, you know, potential set pieces or at least potential marks within the sequence I'm planning as I move around the space. These set photos form a kind of mood board and frame of reference for production down the line. And here's the character. I modeled him in another VR app called Gravity Sketch. I then imported the model and rigged it into a puppet with the skeleton tools inside Tavori. Tavori supports FBX and OBJ and a few other formats. I used FBX here because that's the one that I'm most familiar with and it's kind of supported by most 3D apps. I'm not sure that watching what I'm doing here in video instead of in VR conveys just how much fun it is to pose your characters spatially. I mean, it's like playing with an action figure or a stop motion armature and puppet. Except here, obviously, it's a digital space and therefore much more forgiving than uh, stop mo. But it's really no replacement for stop motion. The tactile nature of that medium just can't be beat. Still, as far as posing CG characters go, this method wins hands down for me over the interface of a traditional DCC. I mean, what a fun way to work out the specific gestures, body language and physical presence of the character you're working with. You know, really get to know who they are before blocking in their performance in the scene. I can tell you that this guy is into ray guns as much as he is into quantum physics. He considers himself a uniquely brilliant scientist and military genius. So in his mind, having mastered both sides of the coin makes him a flawless ruler, the only choice for the cosmos. So the stance I'm trying for here should reflect that arrogance and self-importance mixed in with the aggression of someone who's ever poised to prove himself in a fight. I mean, it is kind of a silly and fun character. A uh, great, great antagonist. With plenty of facets in his personality to, to draw from. And his overall design is something that I can sense check by posing him to make sure that his silhouette remains nice and strong and clear. By doing this, I'm also brainstorming acting choices for the animation. So the timeline here will be pretty familiar to animators. I like seeing scenes blocked in step mode, basically keying all controls and building up movement from the primary storytelling beats. And then once I'm happy with that, to then put in the keys that hit the essential performance poses. And then once I'm good with that, I move on to the breakdowns and the extremes and so on. Fortunately, Victor, the animator whose scene this is, works that way too. This scene is about him receiving new information from his computer. His computer is actually a character in the story too. Together, there's something of a double act. Anyway, the information irks him, and so frustrated, he stomps across to his lab, realizes his experiment is useless, and then gets angrier as he marches to his UFO. Snarling as he scurries up the stairs, he's already pointing fingers and blaming people in his head. And as he hops into the UFO, he revs his engine and takes off. Tavori Viewer is a standalone app that lets you review a scene with other people, even if they don't own the main app. They don't even need a headset, really, because it supports desktop mode. Here, I'm discussing the scene with Victor. Both of us are wearing headsets. And as I scrub the timeline, the scene updates for both of us in sync. And then here comes the exec producer, Inga. I think she's on the Oculus Quest. So now all three of us are reviewing the scene and we just carry on with the meeting as we were and she's picking up on, um, on whatever we've been discussing. And those photos I took in layout are in the same scene too, off to the side with notes. 
not dissimilar to the story meeting in the real world or how dailies are usually done when teams work in the same physical space. Obviously, what we're doing here really speaks to the need for remote review and effective collaboration. Having dailies in a spatial medium makes remote communication a lot clearer. The versatility of the assets I've created means I can enrich my pitch materials with a wide range of visuals if that's what's called for to help sell the project. For example, having a poseable character help me illustrate the front cover of that comic book, not to mention any backgrounds I need for the story panels inside that comic. Likewise, the layout photos gave me a head start on the style paintings and key visuals for the series Bible. And that character model can also be 3D printed as a prototype for the action figure. Obviously, story always comes first but it's great to have the means to create this supporting material. So I think by drawing, my XR spatial design workflows are an extension of that approach. Any success in unified asset creation and any related efficiency metrics reflect my specific use cases and ways of working. But I couldn't help but wonder how those ideas would scale for other creators, for creative teams, can this also help the development process at an animation studio? Would it move the needle for other organizations outside of just me as an independent? So I pitched that as an industry challenge to the Accelerator Program at IBC, the International Broadcasting Convention. And that program facilitated the consortium of companies you see here. Together, we collaborated to explore how XR spatial design could address our respective challenges in the content business. Blue Zoo is the biggest independent animation studio in the UK. They employ 300 plus creators of all disciplines. The studio has been going for 20 years and specializes in high quality cartoon animation for TV and commercials, for which they have won numerous awards, including five BAFTAs. I had the pleasure of working with co-founder Tom Box and his team on this project. Tom, when I showed you the spatial design techniques I had developed, um, I got the sense it was an area that the team at Blue Zoo had been itching to explore. And at that stage, was it driven by a creative or production or business need? Um, I think everything we do is driven by all three, really, um, because otherwise it's it, it doesn't make sense uh, for us to really kind of like push purely in a uh, artistic, creative way. If it doesn't have a business business value to it, it'd be very hard for that to justify that to my other, other kind of co-founders in the company. So, and it, so I think what happened was you kind of, you uh, explained your thoughts on the future and how these um, technologies can be embraced by animation studios. And that really um, resonated with me and everything you said. So, so I kind of thought we're, we're both on the same wavelength and we're really looking ways to explore this and collaborate with other partners. So it kind of really seemed an ideal way of us kind of uh, exploring the space in ways that we hadn't anticipated before. And I remember quite early on you outlined overarching goals right what were some of those goals you had for the poc we really wanted to um to test in a in a robust way as possible um the ways that this technology could be used to um, speed up the animation production process but without affecting the quality because when we see platforms like youtube and the the way audiences want such have such an insatiable demand for content the, the the default way that most companies have dealt with that is by churning out kind of really kind of cheap animation you mm -hmm. know as you see on like uh, preschoolers youtube channels and that's not something we're interested in we want to make stuff that we're proud of and so we we really approach this as can we um can we utilize this kind of uh, spatial technology and embrace it in a way of solving that that what is essentially is a business problem of catching up with what modern audiences want yeah, and you did something really interesting. You baked a very sp specific animation technique, puppeteering, into those goals, right? Because you, you set outside the quality uh, bar, but then you also uh, wanted to investigate that technique in particular. Why was that? Yeah, well, I think because what we do is cartoony animation, cartoony mm -hmm. character animation, and the, the obvious way of um, trying to make that more efficient is to go to the motion capture, then use motion capture with real-time technology. But there's there's always a bit of an uncanny valley kind of uh, feel to the characters. It feels a little bit like a um, a, a a costume character, a theme park where mm -hmm. you, it feels like there's someone inside. So 
and and also we feel like keyframe animation does that really well and we could never match keyframe animation with motion capture when you're doing all these crazy cartoony movements so it's like let's let's park that and look at other things and for for a while now for a few years we've been kind of like playing around with ways of using puppeteering puppeteered um kind of characters in digital animation but we've never really explored it with uh, vr so we thought this is uh, an ideal way of combining the two ambitions of, of seeing how we can explore VR space and using puppeteered animation in a way that embraces the, the movements and the feelings you, you kind of get when you have that, uh, that mapping of a human movement onto a, a digital character that you know is not real. And it's, it's about how can we um, really embrace that, that kind of uh, slight uh kind of puppeteer i guess it's a puppeteery movement in digital animation and utilizing all the amazing advancements in render engines like unreal and unity to to make something that doesn't feel cheap and it feels really kind of like premium and it feels something that we we can be proud of and, and audiences want to watch and at the same time it has that authentic humanness about it which audiences can then really uh, embrace and it doesn't feel too um, synthetic and kind of CG animated. You know, VR can capture um, your movements at such a high fidelity that, um, yeah, the way you married technique to the, uh, the stylized look was really smart. Yeah, and that's, that took a lot of iterations to try and uh, to get that balance because the when you do VR animation and you, and you move things in VR, it's such a direct mapping from a human movement. You almost see the kind of like the, the handshakes and stuff. So there, we had to kind of like try and iron those out as much as possible whilst retaining the essence of the mm -hmm. performance. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, it's all about balance of trying to get the right artistic performance whilst utilizing the technology. And that's what I think is really exciting because we're, you know, we're starting with a blank canvas here with, we're, we're, you know, developing tools and using other tools and kind of really mixing them together in this kind of like cauldron of creativity, which is it's just great fun to do as well. You developed your puppeteering tools in-house using Unreal, using their blueprint, blueprint scripting tool, but then you also used the off-the-shelf um, Masterpiece Studio sculpting a suite. That was one of the reasons we joined the POC, because we wanted to try all these new tools, things, because we hadn't really used um, VR sculpting tools that much before and especially things like masterpiece where you can actually do the you know the rigging in VR as well which is again it's a really uh, exciting uh, technical step to take uh, so the idea was to actually uh, in, the, in the POC the entire thing is made in uh, a VR kind of virtual pipeline and uh, and that each step actually had those uh, those cost efficiencies and and time efficiencies um, built in because for example when you're modeling in in VR because you can see in 3d space you can look around objects and when you're using a traditional kind of Cintiq or you know a mouse and keyboard you're constantly having to kind of like spin around things and we'll, you use a 2d interface to do work in a 3d surface mm -hmm. uh, where in VR it's much more akin to actually having uh, a lump of clay in front of you that you can you can carve and do and do 3d hand movements and you you can't do 3d hand movements through a 2d interface like a graphics tablet so it's really kind of building on uh, those uh, interfaces and tools to develop something that um, that is that's not just a proof of concept, but something we can actually use in, in production and has a real business merit without diminishing the artist's um, workflow, enjoyment, and kind of creative abilities. So it was, it was trying to do something which literally ticked every single box and yeah. is not using technology for sake of technology and is doing something that our, our, our business and customers need. When you think about um, that working spatially now with these tools, you know, what unites your in-house tools with Masterpiece is that it's a spatial interface that has made the process, I guess, more accessible for your artists, right? Less, less technical and you can iterate, as you say, um, faster. And that's, I think, what's exciting is using these tools to develop whole new workflows. It's, it's about bolting them together to do new things, which, which art and creativity is, is all about. It's all about 
you know, having different influences completely outside the space, like puppeteering, and then mixing it with one, technology A, technology B to create a whole new thing that hasn't really been done much before. And if we can use that to solve a business problem, then that's, that's even better. And that's something that, you know, as a studio, we've always tried to embrace by kind of staying ahead of the curve uh, and seeing where that goes. As yeah. It's, yeah. And it's kind of part of your brand, right? It's really important to your brand as a studio, but also your the individual franchises that you're developing there, that you keep the um, quality standards high, but you look for um, the right uh, interface for your, your artists to express what makes that particular show or that particular style so compelling to their audience. All of that locks together nicely. Every production is different. So it's really about seeing what production is suitable for this to go on. One of the things we learned from this POC is how uh, this technology is, is also ideal for more of that previous stage when you need to rapidly prototype uh, either an environment or a shot or you know a whole animation. You can do that in a way that it's a bit like kind of building it with your hands where you just want to quickly kind of get in and, mm -hmm. and make something. And you'll quickly find out if it works or it doesn't work, opposed to the traditional route where you might spend months making animation and then find, oh, I know that didn't quite turn out mm -hmm. how, it, how it did in my head, which then allows you to go on to do other things or, or change it. So essentially it, it shortcuts a lot of that creative process. So it's not diminishing your creativity, it's, it's enhancing it. Those techniques have now kind of moved into some of your social posts using similar character. Yeah. <laughs> In my mind, I thought, could this be a sign of potential new content formats for your studio? Because uh, you mentioned social at the start, right? Are these new avenues of storytelling yeah. because you're now in a, you've got a, you've got a basically a set of tools that you can turn around content really quickly because it's you know, capturing it live. Do you see potential there? Yeah, that was, that was very much one of the drivers for it where, you know, if you want to create stuff on, uh, say YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is, you have to kind of be this, um, uh, almost content factory kind of keeping up with, with demand and animation as much as all the, uh, technologies have, sped up rendering and things like that with GPU rendering, the, the rest of the animation process hasn't sped up. And that presents a business problem for anyone who makes animation. If you're, all your audience has kind of sped off into the distance and you're still kind of like lumbering behind. Uh, so it was, it, it was very much to address that problem of how can we create content for these, these, these platforms without, uh, without having to you know, cut so many corners, it's just churning out stuff for the sake of it. How can we make content that is really fun to, to make still uh, and fun to experiment with and, and explore uh, without, um, without making something that is just looks like it's been you know, created Dashed for the sake out. of it. Exactly, yeah. 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 So and I think there's, there's loads of areas for, to explore that and how it can be used. And I think that's where a lot of tools will be going to in terms of how how can we use animation for these new platforms that don't quite marry with kind of traditional uh, workflows new workflows then offering a promising future for more nimble animation production pipelines your content business stands a better chance of keeping up this way compared to established production methods eon production is a boutique storytelling studio based in Bosnia, specializing in linear and interactive animation content. Whilst they have a long history of using real-time rendering and game engines for series production, our work together over the summer was the first time they'd added VR as a production tool. I had the pleasure of working with the studio's owner, Mladen, and I absolutely loved how freeing the XR spatial design approach was for his in-house artists. Mladen, I remember you describing Masterpiece Studio as being a liberating experience for your artists. The liberating part was uh, that um, it's very intuitive. So contrary yeah. to traditional mouse and keyboard approach, uh, it's not only about getting the quicker results, it's also about uh, doing it intuitively because um, we are not born in... Uh, 3D space where you have X, Y, and Z. Uh, we learned that in school later, just uh, so we yeah. know a mathematical representation. So to, to little baby, you know, you, you can't say uh, move it X, three, Y, one, or whatever. <laughs> you just say, grab this. And it's as easy as that. And it's as liberating. 
And um, that is one of the things. The other thing is when you have some artists that are not that skillful with traditional tools, for example, if they know sculpting, fine, fine art students or my animation students, they just jump and continue sculpting. They just need a couple of minutes to learn the tools and they really, really quickly jump into the process and they don't have that learning curve that we had uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago when we were uh, jumping inside of the new software. It was hell when I first opened Maya. Oh, come on, it was, it was, I didn't know where to begin. While in, in Masterpiece and other spatial tools, it's just go inside, learn these few buttons and start working. I feel like they could potentially challenge how we approach the production pipeline for animation. Do you feel the same way? Absolutely. Uh, the disruptive moment doesn't come only for, from the intuitive approach. It also comes from the moment that um, the learning curve is shorter. So now you have a moment in, in history where the artists are not, um, you know, they are back to the, the, with the chalk or something where you see the immediate result. And uh, in last 20, 30 years, uh, we had the moment where, okay, you know how to do art, but now you have to spend a couple of months to learn how to use this tool in order to create a CGI. And um, the spatial tools are now slowly raising and, and, and uh, diminishing that, that process. There are still a lot of things to learn on the artist side. And as artists, we grow all of our life as creators or storytellers. However, the tools are not the barrier any longer. It's much more accessible to anywhere in the world. So, I mean, the, the VR headsets are also becoming cheaper and cheaper. So everything is much more approachable and uh, democratized. And now the tools are reaching the technology as well. Yeah, going from expensive offline uh, render farms to GPU rendering, which is speeding up the feedback loop considerably for production. Mm -hmm. It feels like VR being powered by uh, real-time engines is a good companion piece for um, for an animation studio that has already moved into the real-time paradigm. Absolutely. The only thing uh, that are still lagging is that connection between the spatial tools and the final rendering environment, whatever it is. So the tools are not there yet, but uh, I see the great potential because uh, I'll just give a quick analysis. We know what's about to happen. And we know what we want to do. We want to be able to jump inside of the 3D space and animate and look at those curves. Even if we have to work, watch the graph editor still, we want to be able to touch it and to touch the objects and to move inside of the 3D. So the need is there and the tools are reaching the point. Right now they are not completely ready, but they are very close and the, the wave is coming. And I will just make a quick comparison with, for example, Blender or real-time rendering. Uh, the Blender and the open source community and the open source um, software approach. Uh, I, I'm watching it for 15 years now and I'm giving the chance to Blender each two years. And immediately when it was ready for production, good enough, let's say, two years ago, I switched my studio to it. The same comes with, with the um, real-time uh, render with the GPUs. We knew about it coming for, for 10, 15 years as well. And we were checking it from time to time and the uh, graphic cards were too expensive maybe for a small studio like ours. And the technology was not there yet, but we, we kept checking it. And once it was ready, we immediately switched. I'm sure it will happen with these tools and they are very close. So that's why we are training our artists, giving them those tools. And that's also why some of the parts of the process we already switched in, inside of the virtual reality. And, and we are giving more and more chance to spatial workflows. So far, we've looked at VR production techniques as they fit into CG pipelines. But what about non-CG productions? Why not stop motion? I was thrilled to collaborate with Eloi Champagne, technical director at the National Film Board of Canada and fellow XR enthusiast. His POC sets out to look at exactly that use case with fascinating results and exciting possibilities for stop motion animators. Eloi, you're no stranger to XR and real-time tech. From VFX production to creating immersive content, your experience is extensive. But what about your journey in using VR as a production tool? Let's, let's start with that specifically. 
it's it's interesting because since the beginning, uh, I always felt that as a tool there was a huge potential. And I, I think was it in 2015 I did a talk at MIT, and that's uh, uh, that's you can probably find that online. That's yeah. one of the comments I was making. It was mm -hmm. that to me, uh, right now um, as it stands, uh, VR was more interesting to. Um, to uh, see it as a tool. The problem though back then is that there was very li little available um, beside Tilbrush eventually that came out, but Tilbrush always felt like some kind of a, a toy to me. There was no, it wasn't production ready. The, the look, the feeling of it wasn't, wasn't great. So it was, it was a great teaser for what could be done, but it, it was definitely not ready for production. But since then, since 2015, you know, the last, four or five years, you've really seen some powerful tools emerge. You know, over, over the summer, we, we worked with some of those. And, and I remember when we met back in spring, I shared the XR spatial design workflows that I had developed. While you were familiar with some, some were brand new to you. So did you know when you saw those workflows, did you know straight away how those would fit into your process? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some of them, especially when I started looking at, into Tivori, um, what, what, one, one of the things that kept me from using Tevori and testing it more was uh, the fact that they had the, the, um, the animation part of it wasn't developed at the beginning. It was really a staging uh, app more than anything, a little bit like uh, Microsoft Maquette. Or, uh, so these things were great to put things, set an environment for a VR purpose. But Yeah, but, layout, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's their layout tools. So for me, that wasn't great. But when I saw, when we started the IBC challenge, that they started to have robust animation tools in there, and they were really thinking about the, the, the tool for that. That really got me excited. It, it, it really corresponded to the tool I had envisioned, you know, a couple of years ago, for, for especially for story development uh, at the NFB. So that's, uh, that's really exciting for me. It's, it's really great. And because we're doing indie project here, we don't have the luxury of having a lot of, you know, big teams, uh, big budget. Um, so what I want is the straightest connection possible between the director's vision and, and at least the, um, the story concept and then, you know, the, the animatic or the storyboard. And if I have to ask my director to work with a team in order to get the vision out, then it comes with a lot of, you know, extra costs. But if the director can just jump in and, and start creating the layout and the timing and the feeling of what they have uh, like that, uh, we're saving a incredible amount of time, money, but also we get to the essence of the story and the project faster and better. And we can experiment with the story more than, than we could in the past. So I think that's a huge value. It's, it's very, very uh, essential for us. And I remember when we, when we started exploring this stuff together, you very early on identified uh, challenges in pre and story development that you wanted to tackle. Um, but expand a little bit more on why these are so important to your projects at, at the NFB. Mm -hmm. It's all about storytelling, right? It's all about getting the story right. And um, there, there's a lot of technique you can't afford, you know, stop motion, a pin screen. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, animation technique that this 2D storyboard just doesn't translate uh, the timing, the, the camera angle, the, the, the lens uh, choice. The, the, there's a lot of things that are not translating well enough. And in the end, it leads to changes in the edit and the timing of, of, um, of the project that are, that are costing a lot of things. And also we can't, you know, there's, there's a limit to how much you can experiment on the story um, on, a, on a stop motion project or on a pin screen project because it takes so much time to develop and to work in that medium. And you have often tools that are like the puppets or like the pin screen that are uh, expensive, fragile. So you can't just say, okay, I'm going to experiment, make multiple version and then edit that into a story. So it's adding flexibility to the previous process. It's mm -hmm. improving the feedback loop for the creators and the creative team, right? It's reducing the stress on the animator when they go for the final take. It still gives them plenty of room to improv oh, yes. improvise, but they've got a much more meaningful blueprint. But you also demonstrated production efficiencies 
And are those resonating mm -hmm. with the exec producers and other leaders in your organization? Because you don't have to be all VR, right? You can plug this into your existing yeah. pipeline and get those efficiencies without it being creatively limiting because in fact, it's, it's enhancing at that stage. Absolutely. Uh, no, that's, um, you have it absolutely right. And yes, they, they do see uh, the interest of that. Especially the producer that we have are really story driven and it's good. They wish to spend as much time as possible developing, working on the story with the, with the creators. Um, the problem sometimes is that our budget are very limited and, and often we think about production budget before we think about all, how much time and how much money we're going to spend in what we call at the NFD, we call, um, the, the development phase. We have an investigate phase where we just basically, we have a pitch and we're just like trying to look at this idea and why is it interesting? So that's really just the beginning when, when somebody, a creator comes to us and mm -hmm. pitch an idea. But then if, if the, the, the producers are happy with that, they will go in development. So now we're going to do some look development. So how, how does that film will look? Uh, uh, moods, uh, mood board, uh, uh, some visual, visual reference and the script and the story. And often it, that phase ends up with a, with a storyboard. Usually we don't even have an animatic at that stage. We have a storyboard and then we go in production. So that, to me, there was always a gap there. We, we have the development phase where we have a storyboard and then we produce. But in order to really get a good production uh, schedule, to figure out uh, what you will, you will need to build, how, how much peace this world will have, how much, uh, what, what staff you will need. Uh, the, the, the more time we can spend at, at the development phase to get the story right, to make sure that we previs as much as we can, um, the, the better the project will be in the end, but also the probably we will save money because we're just going to build what we need to build. We're just going to work on what needs to be worked. We're going to hire the people. We're going to get them at the, at the right time in the schedule. And we're not going to get VFX artists coming in to do effects on a shot that eventually we're going to cut because the story wasn't quite working. Mm -hmm. So it's all stuff that if we can figure out at the development phase, then, then uh, everybody's winning. Well, of course, right now, because of what they are, because of, of how early it is in development, there are limitations and we, we are still going to go back to a to traditional tool, especially if it's a, if it's a linear traditional uh, project, we will uh, edit in a fairly you know, traditional way. But there's a lot of step, step before that in, in, the, in the world building, in the world creation that mm -hmm. I feel it's, it's the potential is huge. And I think VR, those VR tools can help with that tremendously. So right there, LOI and I spoke a little bit about the producer's point of view, but now let's hear from Muki Kulhen, the person who exact produced the project for IBC. Muki, you're an independent producer with a rich career in uh, media and entertainment. You've done TV, music, interactive and immersive stuff, including VR experiences. Uh, was this project the first time you looked at VR as a tool for media production, animation production? Uh, not necessarily for media, media production per se, because I've worked in VR um, across the board for like the more linear and type of cinematic type of 360 um, and spatial productions. But it is the first time that I've had a, a, a really amazing opportunity to work with you guys in the animation industry and really understand how the tools of XR can be used um, to, to be reformatting some of the, the IP that you guys uh, have been working on and, and reversioning some, not necessarily reversioning, but the tools, using the tools of XR within the animation sector. And it's been a really great, great learning curve for me as well. So yeah, I guess repurposing some of the assets, right? So yeah, yeah. creating in VR and then using it for different formats. You exec produced the IVC accelerator program this year and were an early supporter of, of this project, you know, and urged me to pitch it when I told you about the idea yeah. of, of exploring XR spatial designs uh, with uh, other companies. So what did you see in it back then, back in February, 2020, when we, when we met and I told you about this idea, you were, you were on it straight away. So yeah, it was great uh, because I, we had met at the Unity XR Day uh, the week before um, that was hosted in London, one of, the, one of the last of the lockdown sessions, which shifted into 
uh, the February IBC Kickstart Day. And again, one of the last of the lockdown sessions. Pre-lockdown, you- pre-lockdown sessions. Pre-lockdown, yeah, last of the pre-lockdown sessions. Um, and when you were telling me about this concept of, you know, utilizing XR production for, uh, you know, across the board and spatial design, and I, and I was like, this is something that needs to be more known about this is something that people need to know about people need to be starting to experience and when you told me that on the day i was like you have to get up on the stage and explain this as an ibc challenge and i'm so happy you did i was so so glad you did because again um just the 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 challenge that the industry does face with utilizing you know creating some future proofing some of their assets and the ip and things that you could be doing within um the cross-platform spatial design and your project really demonstrated that very very well and we brought together a dream team yeah we certainly did yeah and you know we assembled an amazing group from the gaming world you know the game engine makers through to broadcasters uh and um and ip holders and content makers and the yeah. software vendors as well, you know, the pioneering startups that are creating these XR tools. So with this group of collaborators, there, there were a number of POCs that emerged and each one leveraged spatial design techniques to disrupt animation production in different ways that spoke to their business. Why do you think mm. disruption is such an important element here? Because that seems to be a thread through all of, um, all of their work. Yeah, I think the word disruption uh, is an interesting adjective to use. I think it's uh, when it's pertaining to kind of more of those traditional types of media production that uh, perhaps is still embedded with major broadcasters. Um, anything new or uh, that 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 could cause people to think differently or outside the box or keep people on their toes um, and and push the boundaries of getting away from traditional product, production or complementing in a way it can be known as disruptive. But I also like the word disruptive as something really gritty and forceful that makes people think about change. And we have talked in this POC about how the trajectory of you know, is going up and incorporating XR into different types of production. And that's where, you know, um, disruption becomes complementary into how productions can be done. And just thinking about those procedures and and it becoming a a regular thing. You know, once upon a time, we're making uh, linear types of content, and then we had to adapt to smaller screens on a mobile and uh, thinking about different different screen sizes, different speed sizes. Now we're going to be incorporating, you know, those faster speeds of 5G into things and how can this impact our production yeah. um, as well. So yeah. I just I do like the word disruptive, but I think it's like I either, it, it, it's a word that in my experience, when you say that word, it will make people that might not be thinking outside the box or, or it, within those traditional spaces sit up in deer and headlights moment. Mm-hmm. And it feels like, it's us doing this to strangle people to go, <laughs> you've got to be thinking about different types of production. You've got to be thinking about your audience. You have to think about the devices. Yeah. So you're like, who are you making things for? How are you making it? Um, what devices are they going on? How will people know about it? And uh, I really believe the proof of concept that you developed here, Rafi, can, can help, you know, set some standards perhaps and, and, and get people sitting up and thinking on, on how, to, to, how to turn disruption into an everyday complementary type of production workflow you're absolutely right it needn't be scary right yeah and the word disruption could also be the same as collaboration so again this this what what the ibc accelerators brought and what this team brought you know very cross-disciplinary ways of thinking you know it's one format in animation Mm -hmm. but there were cross disciplines and and the the the, the tools in ar and vr um to our senior level stakeholders like at cartoon network and sky and, and you know to our game engine the the the, the beautiful union of of uh, the first ever media first of two to the major heavy heavy hitting game engines working collaboratively yes unity and unreal coming together for this yeah, uh, so in support of this project disruption equals collaboration um or we just replace the word disruption with the word collaboration i like that let's do that My approach to collaborations like these is to focus on pain points in the pipeline and to come up with complementary workflows that feel more natural to the specific use case at hand. 
the uses of XR spatial design are far too broad for just a one size fits all approach, right? It's also rather nascent. Still, even in these early days, I can honestly feel the difference these methodologies have made to my output as an animation development executive. And that goes double for the positive change it brings to studios as they plan productions, set expectations for previs, and implement learning throughout their creative teams. Thanks very much.